so basically, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool to meet you. Really good to see Especially you finally. here in this amazing It's venue. quite a special place to meet. Yeah. And, you know, my sense is that the mood is pretty low because the public is noticing. I think they're smarter than yeah. politicians think. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. My, my great hope is that what's going to happen at the end of next week is that a lot of people, a whole new tranche, will see, oh my God, they're not coming to save us. They're going to let it burn. And it's going to wake them up and they're going to mobilize. And that is my greatest hope now, that the failure of this cop, because it is going to fail us, will be the mother of all wake up for us. I saw kids, really young kids, marching with a, a look in their eye that I haven't seen before. Yeah. Uh, so just, I was in the march and the majority of people were really quite young. Yeah. And uh, what I learned as being a university instructor was that uh, connecting uh, environmental consciousness at the kind of 17 year old level was too late. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I believe that, that primary education is where we can make the most impact. Very important, but you know, I'm, I'm very concerned. I had a similar experience to you watching the march go by this morning. There's so many angry young people here, and they're right to be angry. But I'm worried that this anger is just going to multiply if it doesn't find some kind of outlet or some kind of response. And anger alone is not usually the basis for success. You need to have anger tempered with love and with determination to act. These things go together, right? And, and you need a kind of a balance. So I think we're in a very difficult place. The, the kids are understandably furious. They, they need something to help them to, to turn that fury into a direction that can, that can change their world for the better. Yeah, I'm involved in the sciences and it's good to see that young people are starting to use the reports that we're delivering uh, at high levels. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, e equipping young people yeah. with you know, science. And I think it's only through a science-based policy that we have any chance. Yeah, we need to be science-based. We also need to be uh, ethics-based. We need to be precaution-based. You know, there's a whole shake-up of the curriculum, if you will, that's needed. I think really we in universities have to lead this. You know, we have to begin with a more serious kind of curriculum change, more ch a change in what we teach as well as what we research, and then we can uh, we can be really credible in letting that spiral down into the, the school system as well. I've become more convinced that it's about education of young people, you know, so we're doing that engagement work in Greenland uh, with our Greenland Trees project, um, helping kids uh, like plant their own food and, and then plant their own trees and then after a period of time they can see their own trees growing. Yeah. Uh, so that's a a small scale effort yeah yeah uh, but you know I'm just an ice scientist but the story that it tells is that the, the sensitivity of the cryosphere is yeah. way more than yeah than even much in the science community recognize yeah yeah and even myself continue to be surprised by how sensitive that system is Absolutely. and it's it's just getting started I know. Uh, the perturbation it, it's slow in reacting and, and there's a big lag in that yeah. system but then once it starts moving how do you stop it right. really hard? So the ice sheets are already tipping past their thresholds of viability. And, but what we can do is, is um, try to apply brakes. You know, we're, all we can really do is try to slow it down, but uh, it's, the ice sheets are beginning to go. I know, you know? I know. And um, there's so much... And the third pole is going to be what goes first, of course. Yeah, I, I heard big numbers today, you know, like half of the Himalayan ice, the water tower of, of Asia is being lost uh, by end of century, you know, that, that, the, the runoff in summer when people depend on that water. So we're going to face, you know, these water crises yeah. before sea level really begins yeah, yeah. to flood. I mean, I always say to, to people, you're worried about temperature rise, you're worried about sea level rise, of course these are problems. But these are, broadly speaking, gradual, predictable problems. There are elements of this system which are much less gradual, much less predictable. The thing which really keeps me up at night most of all is, uh, is food shortage caused by uh, climate chaos. Uh, if 
effects and potential multiple simultaneous breadbasket failures. That seems to me could cut in way before you're getting um, any very serious, I mean mega serious level of disruption from right. sea level rise or even temperature rise. Yeah. So, and, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes I get very frustrated when climate scientists if, uh, sometimes say to me things like, oh, well, but you know, if we reach two degrees, it'll be quite bad. And um, but you know that's a lot less bad than three degrees or four degrees. Of course, that's true. But two degrees, in terms of its chaotic effects, could already be enough to bring down our civilization. Yeah, I say that the loss of water and food security are the immediate problems, and the sea rise is you know distant problem in, in the context of the next decade. So in some ways, you know, the, the sea level thing might be alluring because it's so distant that it yeah, can draw focus away from point. the more immediate so you, loss your, of Your little water. psychological theory there is, is it possible that people are focusing on global overheat and sea level rise precisely because they're not as unpredictable and in a certain sense not as dangerous? Yeah, yeah. Huh. It's That's easier. a disturbing thought. <laughs> yeah, it's just... And uh, you look at the kind of countries that are vulnerable, they include the UK. I mean, the UK is, uh, is not as vulnerable in, uh, in uh, weather chaos terms as many other countries are likely to be. But on the other hand, the UK has much less of a buffer because our food, our food production levels here are way below our food consumption levels here. So, you know, what, what will happen if you get multiple simultaneous breadbasket failure? Well, you'll get a lot of people in the, in the global south uh, suffering, you get a lot of people in the global south dying, you'll get food getting ripped from the global south to the global north. But boy, if, if I was a, a, a planner, I wouldn't like to be sitting here thinking, oh, don't worry, we can just rip off the, the global south and uh, we'll be able to continue eating while they're dying of famine. I'd be very uncomfortable with that. I'd be, I'd be thinking, Christ, maybe they will, if that happens, maybe they will close their borders. Maybe they'll say, no, actually, it's not okay for you to starve our people to death while, while you take all, take all the food. Countries like this one, it seems to me, where we're standing right now, are dangerously complacent in thinking, well, basically, because we're so rich, we're going to be okay for the next generation. I'm not convinced of that. So I say to, to anyone who's saying, well, surely we in Britain need to take care of ourselves. Say, all right, let's take care of ourselves in sensible ways, right? Let's look after our water supply here. Let's look after our food supply here. Let's start creating real, real resilience. Let's start thinking about protecting um, ourselves and protecting others at the same time for what's coming. Because what's coming isn't going to be pretty, but we can act now while we still have some margin. We can act now to make it less unpretty. That's, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs>